Father in heaven, we want to see you, know you more clearly. That's why I tried to write about you in the pleasures of God. And so we ask that by your Holy Spirit, you would come. This is not just a camera thing. This is a soul thing, a heart thing, a mind and life thing. Both for the guys who are here with Bethlehem Seminary and for those who are tuning in. So I pray for all of us that our minds would be in tune with your word, that we would be saturated, filled with the spirit of wisdom and of revelation, and that our answers and our questions would accord with truth, and that our faith would be built up and our hope would be strengthened and our vision for your call on our lives would be clarified and that your name would be exalted. So come and give us your help now, I pray in Jesus' name. Let me say a few things about Pleasures of God before I take your your questions. Um, I went online this morning to remind myself of the sermon series. I preached this as sermons in starting January 1987. So, um, and then I thought uh, of, of this sheet of paper here, which I was going to give to David Mathis anyway. You can't see this probably, but <clears throat> I prepared this in 1993 to um, help us cope with growth issues at Bethlehem. And uh, it's, it's the record of the attendance. Now, from your perspective and from history's perspective that looks good right that looks it's up but notice something one two three four five years we went backward guys this is huge for you to know this is just huge ministerially this looks like up it didn't feel like up half the time half the time it didn't feel like up Isn't that amazing? And the church always has in it people who don't have a lot of hope. They're Eeyore types, you know, puddle glums and naysayers. One dip and the sky is falling. Oh, cut the budget, cut the staff. Ah. Leadership can't let those people hold sway. Can't. You love them, you get your arms around them, and you hand over their mouths and (laughs) try to, don't bring that spirit to the business meeting. It's not going to help. Our God is in the heavens, and he does whatever he pleases, which is what the pleasures of God is about. And I, I went and I tried to coordinate, this is very dangerous, wrong, don't ever do this, to coordinate where the pleasures of God came here, okay? That, what, about nine or ten week series, January 1987, And uh, it it is one of the ups, like here's 900 people average attendance and at the end of the year, four months later, 996, about a 10% growth. So what does that prove? Nothing. It doesn't prove anything. It's just interesting to me. Did we go backwards or forwards during the Pleasures of God series? So I, I got this out. I tried to line it up. I tried to remind myself what it was, what it felt like in those days to preach this, why I preached it. And... And uh, the reason I gave in my first sermon in January 1987 was that 2 Corinthians 3, 18 is the key text for my understanding about how to help a church be transformed through preaching. Beholding the glory of the Lord, we are being changed from one degree of glory to the next. Beholding the glory of the Lord. So, so what I've done over the years is step back and I've asked, okay, what's a fresh way to show the glory of God? That's why we're doing John right now. That's why I go back to 115 and 116 over and over again. We beheld his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And from that fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. And what happens when you receive grace? You get changed, just like 2 Corinthians 3 says. And this, this was the key that God used to unlock this series. This is the little book, The Life of God in the Soul of Man, which on page, in this edition, on page 68, I read this mind-blowing sentence for me in, in 86 or 87. The worth and excellency of a soul is to be measured 
by the object of its love, which was being said about humans. And I just paused and I said, I wonder if that's true about God. That the worth and excellency of God's soul, which is what I want our people to see, would be revealed in what he enjoys. And that's, that's what this is. And I, I think it's true that if you look at what makes God happy and why it makes him happy, you will have a fresh, powerful revelation of his worth and excellency. So I think we're, we're going to talk about chapters 1 to 3 in this session with your questions and, uh, and then next week, the next three and then so on. So there's a hand right there. So when you talk about the pleasures of God and God's delight in being God, do you mainly have in mind God the Father or do you have in mind the Godhead? Because some chapters say the pleasure of God in his son, so that's pretty clear to me it's, yeah. his, it's the Father. But in other chapters, it, it can be more ambiguous. So when you say this is what God delights in, who do you mean by God? Yeah. Sometimes I mean the Father, and sometimes I mean the Son, and sometimes I mean the Spirit, and sometimes I mean all. Uh, and the answer in the end is going to be all, all the time, because I really do believe they co in here, and that they are of one essence, and what the one experiences, the other experiences. Um, I brought along, because I, I knew the first chapter dealt with the Trinity, this book. It's not in print anymore. You may be able to find a copy, but you, for 99 cents, as I tweeted yesterday, you can get the most important thing I've ever read at Kindle on the Trinity, and that's, it's, uh, it's called Treatise on the Trinity, or Essay on the Trinity, right there, page 99 in this, in this book. And Edwards was massively influential to me in this regard. I, I think what's important for us to just feel is that because God is a community of persons, he is love. And then to follow Edwards into why is that the case? Why is there a son? Why is there a spirit? Why is there a father? Why are these images used? And his answer, I'll just put it in a nutshell. I could read it right out of this text is that the father knew the son from all eternity, knew himself, surveyed the panorama of his perfections, the radiance of his glory he beheld. The son is that radiance. The son is his idea and conception and perception and vision of the totality of himself. And it is so full that it is himself over again. And then between them, there is this infinite love between the Father and the Son, this infinite delight. And just answering your question, it's flowing from the Son to the Father. It's flowing from the Father to the Son. And it is carrying so much of who they are that it stands forth as a third person of the Trinity, the Spirit, the love of God. And I just refreshed myself in reading Edwards here about... Uh, 1 John 4, 12, and 13 of why he sees the Spirit as the love of God. The love of God is poured out into our heart through the Spirit. So all the members of the Trinity are fully engaged in the communitarian life of the Trinity. And we have a God, a God who is infinitely happy without us. From all eternity, this is the most amazing and mind-boggling reality to contemplate. That our God, before there was a universe, whatever before means, was not in need of us. Now, more specifically, at any point in the book, I think you just want to ask contextually, is he talking about the Father? Is he talking about the Son? Or is he talking about God three in one? I think they're all involved in delighting in the things that I talk about, whether it's doing all that he does or once I get done with the first chapter, 
I think it would be fair to say we're always talking about the Trinity, more or less. It would be accurate to say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, on page 43 in the new edition, bottom paragraph, um, you're in the middle of answering with a letter somebody that you heard at a particular conference say that God is a risk taker, yeah. and you're refuting that. At the bottom of the paragraph, um, you make the assertion, God is not uncertain about anything. And in the third edition, you have a footnote there that is two plus pages long, where you <laughs> respond to Clark Pinnock oh, on yeah. open theism. Oh, yeah. So my question is, um, maybe not so much why was the footnote removed, but what were you hoping to answer in the third edition when that came up, and then maybe make a comment on 20 years of, have you seen open theism more or less rejected by broader evangelicalism, embraced? Do you see it as much of a threat to this truth now? Yeah, that is a very, very shrewd question. Um, <laughs> and, and good, and good, good. Shrewd, not bad word. <clears throat> um, I, I added it, no doubt. I can't remember the date of the emergence of the second edition, but I did walk into and out of some pretty um, hard debates and conflicts regarding open theism. Clark Pinnock, John Sanders, Greg Boyd be the main people that I interacted with in writing and, and with Greg in person. Um, Pinnock says this explicitly. He moved from philosophy to see if he could find it in the Bible. Greg Boyd, I don't think, would say that. I think he'd say his argument is mainly exegetical. So the position is God does not know for certain what his free creatures will do this afternoon, which means that 10 million worlds stand before God and he does not know which one is going to exist in an hour from now. But his sovereignty is great and he can manage that. that that's the way they would argue about his glory, that he's not thrown off kilter by that. And uh, it, it was a sad um, time for me because I didn't feel like my own denomination responded with the kind of rigor that I would have liked. Um, but it's gone now. Why? And I think my reasoning was, I can't remember exactly, that it really has faded compared to how vibrant it was in those days, at least in my circle. I don't really know for sure out there, but my sense is, is that uh, the spokesmen for open theism are not considered mainline evangelical. They're Marginal, if evangelical. I wouldn't call them evangelical. I think it's a view that is off the table um, as far as Christianity goes. I think it's an unchristian view. However, they're not having the same influence they once did. And so it seemed to me, why would I want to draw so much attention to it when people would say, what's he so bound out of shape about? I haven't heard about this. So that's, that's the gist of it. And I'm I hope that's true, and I'm glad that it's true. I, I would like to see, and now pinnock has gone to be with Jesus. I, I believe um, um, John Standers and, and Greg still hold forth in various ways, and I pray. I just really pray. I don't, you know, when you're 66 and you fought these battles, it's so different than when you're, I think, in seminary. You, in seminary, you look at these guys that are writing their books and whatnot, and you feel like they're just kind of in a world out there that's above the reach of prayer. Don't, don't think that way. I think you should pray for me, that God would spare me folly, and we should pray for anybody whose views we think are unhelpful or hurtful in the hope that those amazing God-given brains of theirs, and Greg may watch this, I, I think Greg is one of the most brilliant people I've ever met, and uh, I would love to see him return to the Reformed theology he did once upon a time have. Where are we? My question is the, the C.J. Mahaney question. The, what's the practical implications of, like, chapter one, the pleasures of God and His Son? I read that, and I loved it. And my question was, 
how would you use that truth in the daily battle to fight for joy? Or how would you use it to counsel someone? Yeah. So. Let me see if I can answer it in two ways. The first way is just return us back to my conviction about the way we Christians are transformed. I don't think mainly preaching transforms people or mainly counseling transforms people by showing them concrete behaviors. I'm saying mainly because I know that the second half of Paul's epistles are in existence. <laughs> mainly by the, the spiritual effect that the truth has in terms of wonder and admiration and awe and delight and cherishing and desiring. If I read this and I moved out of myself, my little tiny me, my little tiny God into a massive God, something happens which affects everything. That'd be my first answer. I mean, I have banked on that for 30 plus years in ministry uh, that, well, I'll give you an example. In 19, Tom, you'd have to help me here, but probably in the first four years of our ministry together here in the early 80s, I just resolved one Sunday because I'd heard so many people say, not enough illustrations, you know, and whatnot. I said, I'm going to preach a sermon from, Acts, from uh, Isaiah 6 with zero application. Just a big, great, glorious God. See what happens. Little did I know that one of the young families of our church had just heard that week that all three of their daughters had been molested for a couple of years. They're sitting there under this ministry of the word with zero application to molestation or abuse. Nothing. And uh, I just, I can remember, in fact, Joby gave me a, what do you call it, a cross stitch of a picture of this sermon hung in my office for a long time of the train of the robe draped over the skyline of Minneapolis. That was the illustration I used. The train, his train filled the temple. I said, okay, let's picture this. This is a small temple. This is heaven. This is a long train. Picture a train draped over the IDS tower. Okay. And on out into the suburbs. And a big throne. And that's the way I preached. I just tried to help people see him. I don't know how long it was. A month or two later, this all came out. And the husband came to me and he just took my hand and he said, only one thing's gotten me through. I said, sex. We have a big, holy God. I tell you, experiences like that, I could give you more, are just profoundly influential. Okay, that, that's answer number one. Um, I believe that practically when you're in a pinch and you wonder if God is sufficient for you, that one of the things he can mightily use to help you through that trial is to remember he is so completely full and happy in the fellowship of the Trinity that he's not dependent on anything in this world and therefore he is utterly free and overflowing to bless you. I really believe that God's love for me is owing to his complete self-sufficiency. Edward said the reason God created the world was that not that he needed the world, but that it is no sign of the deficiency of a fountain that it is prone to overflow. So if the Trinitarian understanding of God's community that satisfies him completely is such that it produces not a neediness, I don't need any more needy people in my life. I need somebody who's there for me, who's just always there for me with infinite resources. And the Trinity helps me live with that. And that helps me with a hundred problems. Where are we? On page 20, you quote Tozer. And he says, God never changes moods or cools off in his affections. Um, and that seems essential in this book for why he's always happy. He never has a bad day because of circumstances. But if I'm just thumbing through my Bible, I see times where he, he changes moods. 
and affections, and he's angry or he, after the flood, he wishes he didn't make man. So how, how do you reconcile that tension? And, and somebody who's never read systematic theology, how would you tell them about that? Yeah, that, that's really good. And, and that is a very uh, dangerous statement because it's, it's not true at one level. God never changes moods. This is not true at one level. He can shift from being angry to happy. He can, he can be grieved. Um, in fact, I, I wrote down a piece of paper here, maybe because I was feeling it, um, that whether it's in this chapter or somewhere, um, my effort to understand the emotional life of an infinite being is to say it is infinitely complex and infinitely mysterious. And I had in mind, um, he, he's angry all the time. Psalm 7, 11. He's grieving all the time because the Holy Spirit is grieved when we sin and somebody's always sinning who's his child. And he's happy all the time because he rejoices when a sinner repents and there's somebody repenting somewhere all the time. So you have a, a being here who is capable of having hundreds of people over here bringing grief to him Hundreds of people over here making him really angry, millions, and, and hundreds of people over here making him as happy. He wants to dance like the father who's receiving the prodigal home. And God is able to take you into his lap in any one of those moods, let's take the happy one, and really be that for you while he's also being angry at sinners and, and grieved over Sin. In fact, probably he can feel all three toward you at the same time. Now, um, back to the, the sentence. God never changes his moods or cools off in his affections or loses enthusiasm. So I, I probably quoted that from Tozer mainly because of the fact that I don't, I don't want to give the impression that God is moody that he is vulnerable like I am to my ups and downs, that whatever God feels, he feels with complete and perfect fullness. He's not conflicted ever. And wherever the uh, emotional um, calls for it, and I think this would be always, his emotions are strong and not flimsy or weak. And the... Uh, Never change would mean all things considered, our God is simple, our God is consistent, our God is uniform, our God's not vulnerable to whiffs or winds that blow along. But I think taken all by itself, that statement, his moods never change would just be misleading. If I had to over me, I'd just take it out of the book. <laughs> because when I come to him, after reading Ephesians 4.30, where it says that um, he's grieved, and the context there is that his people are unforgiving and unkind and don't have a tender heart. And I come and I repent. And I say, I'm sorry the way I treated Noel this morning. It wasn't tender. I'm so sorry I'm not more tender. I want to be able to think, he's not grieved anymore so um, excellent question and try to uh, cope with it in context <laughs> go ahead here we go Steve. as I've been uh, meditating on God's full satisfaction within himself um, it's brought great peace to my own soul it's just laid a bedrock of peace in my soul and also my mind has just gone right to uh, thinking about how I was raised and how my parents uh, were uh, very satisfied within, within their marriage. They loved each other. And, and that peace, that their, their pleasure with, uh, within themselves just brought me, brought me great peace growing up as a child. And so I was wondering um, uh, if you could speak to marriage and to parenting and uh, how, how, does, uh, how does God's satisfaction in himself be a, a, a a wonderful model for parents in, uh, in how they raise profound. their children. I, th I really think it is. Um, 
the mar marriage is not presented in, in the New Testament as a model of the Son and the Father. It is presented as the church and Christ and um, Christ's delight in the church, making the church into a bride that he will take pleasure in. And so there's an analogy between the Trinitarian life and, the, and marriage. Um, when Doug Wilson was here a few weeks ago and spoke of the Father's pleasure in the Son as his first description of how fathers should relate to their children, he took us right there. So here you have the baptism and the first words you hear out of the father's mouth concerning his son is, I like you a lot. Not, I have um, unconditional commitment to you in your sin. That's different. True. It's just different. And a, a, a kid can feel that. My dad's committed to me and he doesn't like me. And you're describing a home where it didn't feel like that. And so I think a lesson would be, yeah, let, let's go to the Trinity. Let's go to how the Father loves his Son and watch him delight in his Son. And of course, we, we have to reckon our kids are sinners. Jesus is not. The analogy breaks down. Fathers must be displeased with behaviors of their son. But there's something fundamental, isn't there, between delighting in your son as your son, as an image of yourself, as one that you hope will be a reflector of God's glory. And here's the second thought besides Doug Wilson's. This morning, while I was exercising, I listened to Sinclair Ferguson on James 5, where it says, uh, is anyone cheerful? Let him sing. And he said, he said, I haven't checked this out. Go ahead and check it out. I think the most common command in the Bible is sing. <laughs> or I think you may have said, praise God with song, something like that. I don't know if that's true either, it's, but there's a lot of them. There's a lot of them. So here you have a, a, a word from James saying, if you're cheerful, go ahead, go ahead, let it show. The people around you need to see you sing. And that makes me think of my home because I grew up where my mom and dad sang. We would be driving home from Fort Lauderdale, Florida, in the car before there were any freeways when I was 10 years old, and they'd be singing. My sister and I in the back seat, they're in the front seat, they're singing songs. How many people get that to grow up with? Almost nobody. My kids didn't hear me and Noel sing. Since some years ago, we've built singing into our devotions with Talitha, and, and, and yet it never quite feels like my mom and dad because they were singers and they knew lots of spiritual songs and just flowed out of them and we sing by plan. And so God is a singing God. He sang over creation when it was made. Our God is a Vesuvius of positive emotions. And if we dads and moms are going to be God to our kids, and I think we're supposed to be, you know, reflect God to them in the early years, we should be really happy. And, it, and if, if much pain is in our lives, they're going to see that, and they should see us bear it well. Because at the front of James, it says, count it all joy when you come into various trials. So at the end, he says, are you cheerful? Sing it out. And in the front, he says, have a hard time? Be happy. And I think, I think God's Trinitarian life points us there. Yeah, Chris. Can you talk about how you delight in God in and through creation? So on page 70, you say, the message of creation is this. There is a great God of glory and power and generosity behind all this awesome universe. You belong to him. He is patient with you in sustaining your rebellious life. 
Turn and bank your hope on him and delight yourself in him, not in his handiwork. And then at the end of the paragraph, you say, day and night are saying one thing, God is glorious, God is glorious, God is glorious. So can you talk about just what that process is like for you? Is it okay to delight yeah, in yeah, yeah. your wife in a <laughs> long run, that sort Thank of stuff? Thank you. Thank yeah. you. That's really, 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 really important. Um, we're thinking about doing the national conference September 2013 on C.S. Lewis, A Reformed Response. And you can be sure that issue will be big uh, because Doug Wilson is on my case to say it better. And we've had personal back and forth emails about this and, uh, and I think we're, we're not very far apart. Um, we ought to delight in the works that God has made. God does. He manifestly does. Let the Lord rejoice in all his works, and he does rejoice. He rejoices over the big squid out in the middle of the ocean that nobody has seen that he made. And I rejoice over that spider I described in here from Ranger Rick. I don't read Ranger Rick anymore, but I used to read Ranger Rick regularly as a 37-year-old. And Ranger Rick had a different amazing creation every time it came. And this one was the spider who lives at the bottom of the lake, a breathing spider. And he comes to the top, rolls over, catches a bubble of air, breathes it as he goes down and puts it under his nylon tent. <laughs> That's the inefficient way to live. <laughs> Highly counterintuitive from an evolutionary standpoint. Go up, get some air, take it down, and make this thing livable. Why don't you just live up here? <laughs> and I look at that and, and I say, how manifold are your works in wisdom. You have made them all. That's surely what Job, what, 38 to 41 wants us to say. Look at the ostrich. She's so stupid. God made her stupid. She lays her eggs and then leaves them for people to walk on. God did that. Um, the difference is that when I ask why, why and how should we rejoice in God's creation, I cannot get away from the, I think, uniform biblical teaching that what makes creation so magnificent is that it displays God's glory, God's power, God's wisdom, God's joy. Have you ever thought about Psalm 19, which, which says, uh, the heavens are telling the glory of God. Uh, the sun rising is like a bridegroom coming out of his tent with joy. So what are you supposed to feel when you watch the sunrise? You're supposed to feel that I'm getting married today. That's what you're supposed to feel. The sun is saying, this is, this is an awesome day. Do you see me blazing 93 million miles away, about a million times hotter than your hottest hot? You see what I'm doing? I'm celebrating getting married today. Something like that. And we're supposed to be amazed and glad, but never forget this is a shadow of our I don't say, just enjoy it and stop. I, I, Doug, no, Doug, I don't say that. <laughs> I don't think he means what I mean when I say I don't say that. Um, I, 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 I'm not an atheist. I'm not a worshiper of things. I receive them as gifts. I say thank you. It's demonic not to say thank you. The pastoral epistle teaches that Marriage and food are given for our enjoyment because they are sanctified by the word of God in prayer. I'd like to know what you say in that prayer. Like you're talking to God in the moment when you're delighting in the food. So eating pizza, this is a vertical affair, not just a horizontal affair. If it's only a horizontal affair, it's idolatrous and atheistic. 
So I, I don't want that to diminish your enjoyment, but intensify it. I would like that to add a depth and an and a intensity to your walking outside. So I walked, I walked outside uh, an hour ago. Now, March is the ugliest month in Minnesota. We all know this. It's ugly out there right now. And I said to myself, should you say that? I'm not sure you should say that. That's like saying the Mojave Desert is ugly because you like forests. Wait a minute. The desert is just another way. So I try to think, okay, maybe this is like Narnia and it's all melting. That's what I did. That helped me. This is the great melt. This is the great thaw. God get us ready. I'm just passing through this ugly month on the way to flowers and leaves and grass and warmth on our skin. This is part of it, isn't it? So maybe I shouldn't talk about ugly. I should, I should try to... This is God made this too. And there's a lesson to be learned here about transitions from winter to summer seasons of life. I'm just blathering on here. I, just, I, love, I love to talk about God as the goal of what he has made. And he has made a world that is endlessly interesting. And we should be interested in it and gives ourselves to, to delight in it. You make a comment that any, any love that we have for Jesus is really the Father's love for Jesus in us, in the Spirit. And so when I read that, my first thought was I want to examine my heart and, and just be amazed that there is any love for Jesus because that's not natural. That's, that's not even my natural love. But then I was wondering, so how do I, you know, as I'm counseling myself, as I'm talking to other people, what's the, how does that look and feel different than my love for anyone else in my life or any other historical celebrity or author? So how, will, how would you think about, man, is this, is this Trinitarian father to son love in me? Or is this just, oh, I love C.S. Lewis because he was a great author or... Excellent. Wow. See, I've not asked myself that question, but ideas are tumbling to my mind as you, as you ask it. That's just, I just love questions like that. So let me say, can we say it here? So w- when we talk about my loving Jesus, it is right to say, if, if my understanding of the Trinity is correct, that the Holy Spirit was given to me in the new birth. The Holy Spirit is the personal presence of the love of God for God, the Father to the Son, the Son to the Father. I now feel affections for Father and for Son because that's the Holy Spirit in me. Any desire you have, any enjoyment you have, if you, like me, enjoy sitting down on your couch, opening your Bible, God is in you, loving that way. So that's, that's, the, that's the analogy. And then you say, now what about loving Others, an author, um, a, um, a singer, um, or I suppose back to nature. Um, is that the love of God for God? Hmm. <laughs> I'd love to have you answer that question. Uh, it can be, I would say, because what, what, what I want to ask myself at any time when I'm finding myself drawn out to admire something, whether it's a song, an athletic feat, a person's intellect, their affections for God, anything out there that's drawing me out to say, I admire that, I love that, that is awesome. What's happening? And it's possible that it's sinful because drawing you away from God. Could, could draw you away from God. But it doesn't have to. If what you're being drawn out in the song or the intellect or the affection for God or the athletic feat is a reflection of the glory of God, the maker, designer. And then the question becomes, is that the father or the son and the father made and he made through the son? The son was 
the creator as well. The Holy Spirit was brooding over the deep. He's involved in creation. So I think it would be fair to say that in as much as your delight in anything that's not God is directed towards aspects of that thing that reflect God, it is the love of God for God. But I'm answering that off the, off the cuff, and so I haven't thought about it as much. Perhaps we want to qualify. Go ahead, Charles. Uh, <clears throat> Pastor John, the big God that you present in this book makes my heart swell and makes Christians' hearts swell with um, appreciation of that big God. But for some, there's a melancholy, a melancholy. For some that are really struggling with being happy in this God, how, do you, how are you pastorally counseling people with depression? Yeah, yeah, thank you. I think I'm, a, I think I'm a, more of a wintry personality than a summery personality. I write all about joy all the time. That's because I want it so bad. Um, I remember a man came and spoke in chapel at Bethel when I was a teacher there, and his whole sermon was built around wintry and summery people. And he went into long descriptions of where wintry personality is and a summery personality. I found it incredibly helpful um, because there are wintry beauties. The world needs winter. Um, but the the summary people are prone to superficiality. The wintry people are prone to depression. And therefore, every personality type has its vulnerabilities. And so pastorally, you want to move in to discern what people's vulnerabilities are and feed the part of them that's lacking. And there is something in this God. I mean, you're just so right to point this out. I think certain kinds of personalities can hear us talk about the bigness of God and it, it, it just feels overwhelming. It doesn't feel like it's resources for them. Here's an example, and this is so helpful to me. I have used the illustration of the Grand Canyon. Nobody goes to the Grand Canyon to increase their self-esteem, which is true. So why do they go? if everybody's so self-centered in the world? Well, they go because the, the law of God is written on their hearts and they're made for bigness. And something happens when they stand before bigness. And a woman said to me, if I'm standing on the edge of the Grand Canyon, I need to know he won't let me fall in if I'm going to enjoy it. I need to know his arms are around me. And he's close enough, tender enough, not to just be down there in the bottom and see me! Because she's up there feeling unbelievably vulnerable before this big God. That's so helpful for me. That's so helpful for me. And so I think we need to say what's, what's... awesome about the bigness of our God is that part of his bigness is his nearness. Part of his bigness is his tenderness and his intimacy. If you have not read Lewis's sermon on the excellencies of Christ, read it. Because this is what he does. He just for page after page describes these juxtapositions of seeming opposites in his meekness and his majesty. Just one after the other. And he says, what makes his majesty so uniquely admirable is that it's mingled with meekness. What makes his meekness so uniquely admirable is that it's mingled with majesty. And so I I hope this, this vision of God isn't abstracted as what everybody needs is to feel vulnerable on the edge of, of the Grand Canyon. Well, we do. We do tremble before him, all the earth. But then the message comes that this is the man to whom I will look. He who trembles at my word, I'll look to him. I'll take him. 
He's my child. I'll sit him on my lap. I'll protect him. I won't let anything befall him but what is good for him. So that, that's the big picture of how I would move in on such a person. But pastorally, you just need to discern what are you dealing with here? What, what are the issues here? I, I got my first copy of the newly issued uh, journal for biblical counseling. I used to read it religiously. Then they stopped publishing it for, I don't know, everybody know, 10 years or so? Now it's back. And the first article by David Pallison. I used to say, the main reason I got that magazine is to read David Pallison's article. And so I started reading his yesterday, and that's the first thing he said. What makes Pallison so helpful is that he's just so tuned into the complexities of real people. And that anything canned is not going to fly very far. You just need to listen long enough, not just because listening is the key and everybody gets helped by listening, which they do, but because listening tunes you in to what you're dealing with. And so I just think that would be the wisdom part of taking this. You know, interesting little thing here. When this was first published, David Pallison, maybe he'll listen to this too. Thank you, David. He, he got in touch with me and he said, I want you to come and meet with us at uh, CCEF and talk about this book. This is important for counseling. That's what he said. That was a long time ago, 15, 20 years ago, but interesting thing that he would, he would feel like these truths are, are relevant for counseling. Uh, on page 14, you've, uh, towards the bottom, you've just kind of finished talking about a section uh, where you were reading for your devotion Psalm 3 and you were having this kind of fingernail of the sun come up and then it kind of uh, came in its full strength and you realized you couldn't look at it in its full strength and, and yet you started thinking about how you, there's a sense where God is able to look at the full strength of the glory of the sun and that you are looking forward to that day. And, mm -hmm. and down at the bottom of that section, you say... Did you say page 14 or 14? 14, sorry, yeah. It says, um, I thought to myself, surely this is one thing implied in John 17, 26, that the day is coming when I will have the capacity to delight in the sun the way the Father does. My fragile eyes will get the power to take in the glory of the sun shining in his full strength just the way the Father does. The pleasure God has in his son will become my pleasure, and I will not be consumed but enthralled forever. And uh, I've been in youth ministry for quite a while, and um, one, of the, one of the most common questions that I get is, what is heaven going to be like? Mm -hmm. And as I think of Psalm 1611, you know, in your presence there's fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore, and as we think about the reality of what we just saw here in, in uh, John 17, and we think of 1 John 3, 2, that one day we will see him and be like him, because we will see him as he really is, how, how, do, how do we talk about seeing Christ and, and it not just being this kind of grand arena of people beholding this brilliant Jesus, but like I think that that is a reality that will be there, but how do we balance that, or is there, how, yeah, how do we balance that with the new creation, and, and how do, experiencing God beyond just seeing his brilliance in heaven, and, and what does that do for us as we hope in heaven today, so. Boy, a lot of questions there, and I'm thinking youth, when you, when you say it, I, I so much want you guys, all of you going to be involved in youth ministry, to not think you got to throw this book away and, and just, you know, bob for apples, in a toilet filled with Mountain Dew. Um, it is possible, I think, I think our young people are craving for a vision that's relevant to their lives. Could go there. And that's why the new heaven and the new earth really matter. I can remember as a little kid, we had a spiral stairway at the back of our house that went up to a landing. It was on the roof, flat landing with, with a tar and gravel covering, and then it walked up on the shingles. And as a little kid, I'd go up there at night, 8 o'clock or so, and I'd, it's dark in Greenville, South Carolina, and I'd lie down on my back on the, on the roof and look into the sky, and mainly I was scared. When I thought of eternity and infinite reaches, I was scared. And one of the reasons I was scared is not hell mainly, but that heaven would be, heaven would be boring. 
what? Eternity of church. I didn't. I just, I, we need to help them with this. We really do. Because if, if deep down inside, kids are saying, God, he's going to be so boring forever. We really need to help them. And, and one of the ways to help, I just give two. When I think of the beauty of Christ, the glory of Christ, don't think of a picture on the wall or even a, a person in his risen body walking around. I mean, you can only look at a physical body so long before you say, oh, God, I've seen the physical body. That, I mean, that's what's meant. I think what's meant is there are, the, there's the whole history of redemption. Christ is a doer and all that he's ever done and will continue to do. He will do exploits in the age to come. And so rehearse for the kids the doings of Jesus that make him amazing. Use the gospels that way and extrapolate those into the age to come and say, he's going to keep doing lots of these kinds of things and we'll be amazed at that, we'll be amazed at that, we'll be amazed at that. So try to help them not feel like the glory of Jesus is a static statue or picture or light bulb or, you know, it's like, how can that last for a million years? but rather infinite radiance of ever fresh revelations and memories of, of what he's doing. And the second thing is he, he made us so that we have hands and eyes and ears and, and bodies. Why? To throw them away? He's not going to throw them away. So one of the differences between Christianity and Platonism. He's not going to throw them away. We're going to be who we are in our ethnic realities and our, our uh, whatever makes us physical because Jesus came forth as a recognizable Jesus. So help them feel like, okay, if I enjoy physical things here, sunrise, sunset, my friends, this is huge for kids, you can have friends there. You're going to talk there. You're going to listen to music there. Don't doubt you're going to shoot buckets there. And guess what? You'll probably be good. <laughs> and on, on lots of other things. But at that moment, beware of reducing the God-centeredness of our faith to a worldliness just to get the kids on board. Make the connections between why would playing sports be godly? How could it now? How can it then? And all the other things. At least if, if I were youth ministry, I would be tuning in over and over again. What are these kids fascinated by? And it's not hard to find out. I mean, just read their Facebooks and whatever else. Just find out. And then think, okay, either they're moving into idolatry or this is redeemable. There's an analogy here, and I can help them bring that back under, under the lordship of, of Jesus. Ryan. So uh, the Father perfectly loves the Son. The Son perfectly loves the Father. Holy Spirit is the love between the Father and the Son in a person. And then you've got Romans 5.5. 5. I'm just, uh, you know, hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. But then when I'm at home with my wife and my three daughters, God's love is perfect, but it doesn't always play out that way. So if God's love is being poured into my heart or has been poured into my heart through the Holy Spirit who's been given to me, how come this love that's flowing out of me is not that same perfect love that's been poured in? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, two answers. And uh, I'll, uh, I'll put those two answers in, in the context of uh, the visit of our, our friends from Princeton. And Justin's back there because I thought at first we were going to have um, table talk today. I think, oh, we got to talk about this. And uh, I didn't get to go to that retreat. Raise your hand if you went to that retreat. Okay, a few of you. Um, but I did spend an hour with them and then uh, and listen to some some tape. Two answers. Uh, the Bible says, "Be filled with the Holy Spirit." Uh, the Bible says, "Don't quench the Holy Spirit." Um, the Bible prays that we might be filled with all the fullness of God. And therefore, the Bible gives us some steps to take. That's, that was what they were emphasizing. There are steps. There are paths. Um, 
along which the Holy Spirit works more powerfully than other paths. That's true. That's true. And so one of the reasons that you and I aren't as consistently loving towards our families is that we haven't uh, immersed ourselves as fully in those paths as we might. That's what they wanted to say. The other side of the truth is God is sovereign. And I don't think it's true to say that after the cross, when we are fully accepted by God, it really just depends on us. That's not true. Because God is still sovereign over me. I look at history and I think, there have been some amazing works of God in seasons where that ministry was wonderfully blessed and around it, in spite of its prayers, we did not advance as fully as we might have. There are mysteries here. There are mysteries as to why God might withhold. This is the key issue. Why God might withhold some advances in sanctification when you're seeking them with all your might. I, I just don't think it's the case to say the reason you're not as holy as you could be is always owing to your failure to pursue. It's more complex than that. Now let me back up and end by saying it can always do better. <laughs> we can know more of his power in worship we can walk more consistently in triumph over sin than we do. And therefore, that's why I, when I wrote to, to, to Justin after our meeting, I said, don't ever grow weary of, of leading us and all of us pursuing the fullness of God in prayer. Let's never settle with where we are in our intensity of affections for him, our love for each other, our triumph over sin, our advance in the world, ever, ever, should we say, I'm where I should be. Got it all wrapped up. You're never there. But, but I don't think the way forward there is to say it is entirely dependent on us. I want to I wanna have a yieldedness there to say, I don't know why God might, after my praying about something for a hundred or two hundred times, it would come at the two hundred and one first. I don't know. God is God. And let me pray for us. Father in heaven, thank you for our time together. And I pray that my inadequacies would be overcome by your word and spirit and that we would take what we've heard and grow in grace. And that we would indeed, Lord, avail ourselves of the means of prayer to grow into the fullest possible experience of your grace in our lives. I pray this in Jesus' name.